Good evening all, and welcome. Before the video begins, I have a few quick announcements. The first is that I'm only placing three adverts in this video, and they will be at the start. I'd love to see your reaction on it, so let me know. Secondly, tonight I have ten stories for you. But, for anyone who is a fan of The Conjuring movies, I have a real nugget today. Story 10. The last story is an account of someone who experienced something demonic in their home over the years, and who has proof that they were visited by Ed and Lorraine Warren. This kind of story doesn't come around very often or at all, and with photographic evidence that I'm going to add in the video. So be sure to stick around, and it's a super long story. Um, I really, really hope you enjoy it, and I would love for you to comment, leave me your feedback, subscribe, and like the video. Do all those things if you want more content like this, but, but enough from me. It's time to get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. I'd like to start off by saying that I have never believed in ghosts nor spirits. I live in Ontario, Canada with my wife, and have two kids aged eight and six and a German Shepherd pup called Marshall. We've lived in a two-story, three-bedroom house in the quiet outskirts for five years, and have never had anything strange happen. But in the last few weeks leading up to this event, we noticed the dog and how he would sit up really quickly and turn his head side to side, sometimes even run after something and just stop at the wall and look up. Me and my family would laugh because it was funny to watch, but figured he was doing puppy things or just seeing reflections, as we have full sun and large windows. Just last week, it was like any other night. I lay with my son and my wife lays with our daughter in their rooms. We read a story or just talk before saying goodnight. After the kids were in bed and settled, we watched some Netflix till about 11 or so, and then off to bed we went. I fall asleep very easily. But that night, I woke up to my son rubbing my arm saying, Daddy, Daddy, my foot hurts. Can you come and lay with me? This isn't unusual. He has woken me up plenty of times before saying his foot hurts or the usual bad dreams that a kid might get at night, and it normally leads to him laying with me or I go lay in his bed until he falls asleep. I look at my alarm clock and it's 1.26am. Yeah buddy, no problem. So I sit up, give him a soft rub and try to get my wits about me after being woken up. So I stand up, grab his hand and walk out of the room down the hallway about 20 feet and enter his room. I look at his bed, and he's in there sleeping. I can see this as he has a nightlight, and at this point I was in shock, thinking how can this be? I'm holding his hand and he woke me up. After about five seconds, I look down and see a figure that looks just like my son smiling up at me. And I knew this wasn't right at all, because there were no eyes on this figure. So I took off back to my bedroom trying to figure out what the hell happened. I didn't want to wake up my wife and tell her what just happened, because that would not go too well and she would lose her mind. And would be even more scared than I am, or say I'm just dreaming it. After sitting on the edge of my bed for a few minutes, this sinks in even deeper. I went back down to my little guy's room, feeling like I'm being watched. I wake him up gently and say, hey buddy, wanna come cuddle dad? He looks confused for the first time in the middle of the night that dad is waking him up for a cuddle. I took him back to my room because I didn't want to leave him in that room alone after, and I haven't really slept well since. It's also made me think about other nights in the past that he's woken me up. Was it really him or the figure that I encountered? Or the nights I said, yeah buddy, cuddle up to me, and when I wake up, he's back in his bed. What about then? Was it really him? I hope whatever it is is gone. I don't want to see it again. Has anyone had any experiences like this? Or knows what I may have encountered that night? My childhood home 
was definitely haunted. I could feel when there was a presence in there somewhere. There's a palpable sense of being watched. There's a tension and paranoia in the air that lingers and can even simmer into full-blown terror. It makes you feel very vulnerable. When I was a younger child, I remembered seeing glowing red eyes hanging in the air in my dark living room. I thought our house had werewolves or vampires. There was a phase in third grade when glowing orbs would hang out in my room for several minutes at a time, which I interpreted as aliens. My child mind was trying to make sense of things, but I definitely had a fear of the dark, specifically in our house. Most places were fine in the dark, but in our house, I always felt like I was being watched by something with malicious or, at best, neutral intentions. Paranormal activity ramped up for me in high school, but to remain chronological, I had my cousin stay at our house one summer while most of us were on vacation. This was between 7th and 8th grade. My cousin Billy was helping my dad with various projects, and one night was going to bed in one bedroom, later dubbed the spooky room. Outside in the dark, he saw a figure leave our garage and enter our home. My dad, right? Billy, 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 help me. My cousin heard my father shout. Billy rushed to check on my father. My father had been sleeping and was irritated by Billy's presence. Billy went back to bed, only to hear it again. Billy, Billy, help! Again, cousin Billy rushed in to check on my father, who was fine and confused by Billy's urgency. Billy slept on the couch that night. I didn't learn about this until years later. A few years go by and my brother moves away to college. I moved into his old bedroom, the spooky room. It's my freshman year of high school, and I was always particularly creeped out by this room, but hey, new changes are often intimidating. One morning I wake up to see a skull perfectly drawn on the dust and the window across from where my head lies when I sleep. The layer of dust was facing the inside of the room, not the outside. No one had access to the room except my parents and I. They are not pranksters by any means. I show my mum and wipe it away. A few weeks later, I'm studying in that bedroom. It's night, the lights are off, so the windows turn into mirrors. I look up from my bed towards the skull window and see in the reflection a white silhouette standing behind me. I hold my gaze for maybe 10 seconds, just trying to grasp what I'm looking at. I eventually turn my head around and see nothing. I look back at the window and see nothing in the reflection. I sleep on the couch for the next few nights. A few weeks later, I'm laying in bed, listening to a late night radio show. The lights are off, looking through that same skull window, when I see a similar white silhouette outside stride past my window. And I sleep on the couch for several more nights. Over the course of the weeks, I see more things drawn on the dust of the window. Generally, it scribbles and shapes. I'm scared they might be some sort of curse or something, so I wipe them away. Out of curiosity, I place a sticky note on the window that says, please write below. And several days later, a perfect circle appears around the note, as if someone had used the base of a paint can against the surface. This wasn't like the finger drawings I'd seen earlier, but one of them really did stand out. It was like a number of figures and then one ascending into the sky. Over the years, I've shared this with friends and colleagues, and they mostly come to the same conclusion. But yeah, for the majority of high school, I slept with the light on, avoided that side of the house like the plague, and little things here and there, but nothing huge, until my senior year. I'm in the living room with my mother watching TV, and the clothes dryer is finishing. The dryer is directly down the hallway from the spooky room. I suck it up and head over to empty the machine, getting my usual fear of immense dread and paranoia as I enter that side of the house. I bend over and start unloading the laundry, and my mind goes blank, and I lose control over my motor functions, my arms go limp, and beyond my control, my body stands up, and I hear a masculine voice take a deep breath and hiss in my ear. 
I immediately gain control of my body and get the hell out of there. Around the time period, my aunt comes to stay with us for a month or so. She had no idea what I had experienced, but literally on her first day, the bathroom door slams hard on her, and she immediately had us smudge the house to ward off whatever was there. I was a member of the Suffolk Regiment Living History Group. In the early years of the group, we used to use a local fort in Medway, Kent for basic and combat training. Fort Amherst is a Napoleonic fort with tunnels dug out by Welsh tin miners. Over the years and under construction, there were many deaths. There are two gates, with the lower gate being a toll gate for the original Chatham Road. This gatehouse and lower barracks were also the scene of a serious fire, which resulted in the deaths of some scouts back in the 50s. As a unit, we used to have the run of the fort's unrestored areas and parade square, on occasions using the lower barrack blocks, and even the public enjoyed seeing the place being brought back to life, even if it was World War II Tommies. Over the years, we had many fun experiences from confused soldiers from local barracks, from upsetting role players and LARPers, to gate crashing a rock video filmed in the lower moat. We also had a fair few paranormal encounters to match. On one occasion, we were doing night maneuvers in the unrestored area, when I noticed a dark shadow following us. The human shape was black as black, and stood out against the night and the trees of the wooded area. Being next to the army barracks, I naturally thought it was Mod Plod, military police. The shadow man kept up with us and appeared at every turn. What was strange was the lack of sound of broken brush, yet we made noise due to the equipment we carried. The shadow kept at a distance but was close enough to be seen. We had returned to camp and the shadow watched us from the forest line before turning and vanished. The next day I spoke to one of the volunteers and asked the question, and the answer I got was puzzling. There was only one way in, and a deep defensive ditch all around, and the military police don't patrol there. So who was the shadow that followed us? Who moved without making a sound, when twelve World War II soldiers blundered around in the dark? The second event took place, in the lower gatehouse. The gatehouse had two levels with two doors, one top onto the drill square and the other on the former Chatham Road. After finishing a session of square bashing, we had entered via the top door. The last person had locked the door and put the large metal bar across it. The top level had three rooms in which we stored our equipment, such as webbing, helmets and great coats. The pegs are about five inches long, with round knobs at the end, which would stop equipment from slipping off. We hung our kit up and headed down to the lower levels to set out our beds, light fires, and to start dinner. It must have been around 8pm when we heard distinctly heavy footsteps overhead. Myself and two others had rushed on the top to check. No one was there, and the door appeared to be locked. We went back downstairs to carry on socialising and taking pictures when we heard it once more, then followed by an almighty crash. We ran up the stairs making a hell of a noise as we were wearing army boots. When we got to the top and checked out the rooms, in the room we found our equipment three metres away from the pegs, webbing on the bottom, small pack on top, with lightweight gas masks on top of all the packs, and Tommy helmet placed on top. How did they slide off a level peg? How did they float three meters away and stack up neatly? The webbing wasn't light and had to be lifted over a stopper, and the door was still bolted. As you can imagine, we didn't sleep much that night. I visited my home country of the Philippines in 2018 for the first time in four years. My parents, for some reason, had a two-foot statue of a saint in their bedroom. One night, I asked my cousin to get my laptop for me in my parents' bedroom. I watched her open the door and she froze. When I asked her what was wrong, she said there was a little boy standing by the statue. 
You couldn't see his face, but he was wearing a white t-shirt, and you could only see from the waist up. She closed the door and never went back in. A little later on, my sister came home from work. She still lives in the Philippines. And as we're having dinner, I ask her if there's a ghost in the house, and she describes accurately what my cousin saw, bearing in mind they hadn't spoken to each other since that happened, but added that he's harmless and that he likes to play with the statue. Wherever the statue is, he will be, and that he also enjoys playing in the bathroom. She said a lot of family members who have stayed in our house whilst we've not been visiting have also seen him. We spent the next 10 or so minutes talking about where he could have come from and who he might have been. We knew a guy called Mr. Welzheimer that died in our house. And when anything weird would happen, like things falling off shelves or foreign coins appearing on the stairs that had no reason to be there, we joke it was him. One day, my mum and a neighbour were replacing a toilet in our bathroom and were busy working away upstairs when my mum heard the door open and close and a deep, booming voice say, I'm home. She thought it was me. At the time, I was just a teenage girl and assumed that I was joking around. But it wasn't. I was over at a friend's house. When she came down to greet and investigate, she found that all the doors were locked front and back, and to her surprise, I wasn't there. We're relatively sure it was our resident ghost playing a prank. I worked for American Cruise Lines for a few weeks from May to June this year. I'm going to tell you that the boat I worked on was haunted as hell. There was one occasion where I went to go up to the second floor of the ship. When I went up to the second floor, I noticed someone. It was what appeared to be a naked old lady playing with a door handle in the midship vestibule. I saw her and went back downstairs to let somebody know that a lady was walking around in the nude, obviously breaching policy. When I found someone, we went to find her, to help her. But we couldn't find her. No one could. The ship's mate and I went to the cameras to figure out where she had gone to offer further assistance, and after looking over the camera recordings for a 45-hour window, there was no recording of her anywhere on board, even where I had supposedly just seen her. The house that I'm about to refer to was one of the original houses on the street where I live. Before the property got subdivided into smaller lots, this was in the western US, and before this house, the land was undeveloped and unsettled. But this house was older than the others on the street, and the original owner died in that house. Presumably, the recurring ghost was the original owner, who never fully departed from the land that he settled. Again, to clarify, this wasn't our house. But three separate families lived there while we were neighbours. The first family lost the house in 08, and it was vacant for a year or so before the second family moved in. They left the state a few years later, and the house was empty for a month or two before the third family boothed in. Both times, the new occupants did not communicate much or at all with the previous owners. And when we spoke to them, all three of them described the exact same ghost to us. An old man who would walk into the kitchen and sit down at the table in the morning. One of the women who lived there was so frightened by him that she would only enter the house to sleep and spent all day, every day, outside caring for her flowers. My friend Carl's last apartment had two ghosts 
One was a little girl who would play with your hair while you were hanging out in the living room, as well as running along the vertical blinds, making them swing back and forth. The second I never saw or heard, but I did feel. One night I locked myself out of my apartment, as we lived in the same complex, one building over from each other. So I asked to crash at Carl's place for the night while he went to work. But he had told me not to go into his room. There's a male ghost who will tell you you don't belong in there. His previous roommate had let several friends crash in his room and a tall black shadow opened the door and said get out to all of them. It freaked them the hell out. So here I am on the couch in the living room, heading to the end of the couch that looks down the hall to the bedrooms and bathroom. I swear I was being watched. Then it hit me I needed to pee, and the bathroom is right across the hall from Carl's bedroom. Fantastic. So I slowly creeped down the hall, and about five feet from my goal, I said, Hey man, I just need to use the bathroom. Then it felt like a cloud of energy got pulled back into the bedroom despite the door being closed. I did my thing and went back to the couch and put my head on the other end. Nothing outstanding, but just that creepy vibe that you can't let go of. I have a scary story to share. Last year, late at night, I was in my room. I live in an apartment building on the fourth floor with three other flats on the floor. Well, one night, I was binging on some TV series, and it was around 3 a.m. when I heard a girl running and laughing. I ignored it, thinking that it may be someone coming home late. But the running continued. At this point, I sit up in my bed and ask myself, where is the sound coming from? After listening very carefully and being very smart and having watched too many horror movies, I knew not to go and investigate. So I just tried to find the general direction. I thought it was coming from upstairs or downstairs, and the separate building is too far. It's not echoing either. So where, I asked myself. I deduce that someone is laughing and running in midair. Once I realized that, I asked myself if I should check it out. So I did the next best thing. I stuffed my headphones in my ear and continued binging my series to avoid ghostly encounters. The next morning I told my family about it and my sister, to my horror, said that she had heard it too and was actually very scared to leave her room. Neither of us ever heard the ghostly laugh after that. We wonder what the hell it was. From 1987 to 1992, my family and I survived one of the most incredible hauntings ever documented when an unknown entity invaded our home and dominated our lives. From Ed and Lorraine Warren to Dr. Evelyn Panglini, the most notable experts of the day investigated our case. For decades, we maintained silence in those years, but now we seek answers. The events I wish to convey are centered on the most pivotal events of this haunting, but there were many more people, phenomena, and incidents evolved than I can adequately include in this summary. I can't tell you for certain when it truly began, and I don't think anyone could. By our reckoning, the first incident took place in 1981, Rancho Cucamonga, California, directly after the death of Dominica Cuchilla, the grandmother of my then future husband, Bill Moffat Jr. The morning after her passing, Bill Jr.'s parents, Lee and Bill Sr., received a 3 a.m. phone call. A woman's voice ripped through the receiver. It was Juanita, the family housekeeper. She had been hired to care for the ailing Dominica, and she now was screaming that she was being chased through the old house next door. Together, Bill Jr. and his father rushed over. As they arrived, Juanita burst out through the front door pursued by a large orb of white light. The orb flew up into the sky and vanished, but Juanita kept running, fleeing to their house. Lee received the terrified woman and ushered her inside. Juanita wouldn't tell Lee what had happened. 
She kept babbling an apology in broken English, insisted that she had meant to help. Eventually, she asked to make a phone call, and soon an unknown car pulled into the driveway. Juanita bolted out of the house. She paused long enough to leave a final warning to Lee. Don't go back to your mother's house. There is only evil there. And despite Juanita's warnings, the miserly Bill Sr. demanded the old house be cleaned and rented out. During the process, they found hidden the aftermath of Juanita's secret activities hidden throughout Dominica's home. Broken rosary beads placed in the corners of the house, candles and bottled incense, long scratches along the hall walls and animal remains. A devout Catholic, Lee was horrified to discover the remains of what she feared were profane, occult practices. Shortly after Bill Jr. and I married in 1987, our family began renting out the two properties we owned on Archibald Avenue, both of which were adjacent to our home. One was the Menica's old house, and the other was a house Bill Jr. had inherited from his late aunt and uncle. The first incidents I personally observed occurred after we rented out a room in Bill's house to a young man named Danny. During one of our house inspections, Bill Jr. and I found that someone had accessed the den, where Bill Jr. kept his various sports memorabilia secure. A collection of baseball bobbleheads had been arranged into a large triangle on the floor. We assumed that Danny had done this, possibly as an odd prank, and later confronted him. He claimed not to know anything about it, but by rule of proximity, he was the only sensible suspect. Days later, Lee discovered some underwear draped over the statue of Jesus on her Catholic altar. Just as we had thought with Danny, she assumed that one of us had played a tasteless joke. We couldn't convince her otherwise, but every morning after, there would be new objects waiting in the Jesus statue's open arms. Eventually, Danny's personal belongings began showing up on the statue, such as his mail and his wallet. We knew we couldn't ignore what was going on, but how could we explain it? Danny soon moved out on short notice. Immediately, the items ceased appearing on Lee's altar. Given the timing of the events, it seemed that our former tenant was somehow involved in these inexplicable episodes. We couldn't know how, and we didn't need to. Life could go on as normal, and that was enough for us. We intended to rent out Bill Jr.'s house again, and so had to inspect and clean the property. Danny had kept the place tidy, with a puzzling series of exceptions. Directly above every light switch plate in the living room were tiny symbols drawn in crayon. These symbols were completely alien to us and only supported our assumptions about Danny. The only other area that needed cleaning was a dusty row of dog statues that were arranged on a high shelf in the living room. I turned away, calling Bill Jr. for a stool, and when I looked back, every single statue was now facing the wall. Something had turned them all around at once. Bill Jr. was quick to dismiss my claim. You're just imagining things, Debbie, he said. The statues were probably like that before we got here. It's easier to agree than argue, but I knew I hadn't been mistaken. We resumed cleaning the next day. We found a lamp sitting in the middle of the living room. The doors were all locked and all the windows were intact. Bill couldn't dismiss this event as an illusion of imagination. No one would have entered the house, so it had to be something else that moved the lamp. So I asked for something else to move other objects. Since these weird occurrences had started up, nothing ever happened directly in front of us. I reasoned that we'd have to step out of the room. We stepped out of the kitchen, counted to ten, and returned. The dining room table was now occupying the middle of the living room. Terrified of the paranormal, Bill Jr. verged on full-blown panic. My husband suffered from cardiomyopathy, and this sort of strain was dangerous for him. We left, and later informed his parents of what we saw. Though Lee was nearly as fearful as Bill had been, Bill Sr. waved her concerns away, and urged us to finish cleaning the house. A mismatch couple by the name of Tom and Michelle were the next to move into Bill Jr.'s house. We also had another tenant who had been living in Dominica's old house, an older man named Monty. Around this time, he made arrangements with Lee and Bill Sr. for his son Brad to move in with him. 
After everyone was settled in, it wasn't before long that new worries begun. Brad was a reclusive young man who never spoke nor smiled. We figured he was just a reserved individual, and it seemed we were wrong. On one of her neighborhood walks, Lee passed by the old house. She witnessed Brad in the backyard, planting a tree upside down so that the roots were topside. And when he noticed her, he stared back, shovel in hand, rising to a stand as though his body was drawn up by strings. Lee hurried home, frightened he was going to give chase. One day, I noticed Michelle next door lingering in the front yard. Her face was swollen and discolored with fresh bruises. She whispered that she and Tom used to get along fine, but he had become violent and irritable since moving into Bill Jr.'s house. I offered to take her to a shelter, but Michelle assured me that she could take care of herself. A week came and went, and Michelle was nowhere to be seen. Tom informed me that she had left him and wouldn't be returning. Weeks after her departure, Tom too left without formal notice. Like Danny before him, he had left the property spotless, though one of the living room throw rugs was missing. Whether Tom had taken it or thrown it out made no difference to us. The rug was old and falling apart anyway. A strange man came to Bill Jr.'s house a few days later looking for Tom. I informed him that Tom had left, and we didn't know where he was now. The man then asked if I had heard about what happened to Michelle. Her body had been found in a landfill, wrapped in a rug. Bill Jr. always had his nose in the newspaper. He said he neither read about the story nor saw it on the news. He was confident the man had just been putting us on. But my first reaction was to call the police. If Michelle had been murdered, we may be the only ones with any information on her. Lee vehemently insisted that we keep to our own business. Her father had been a powerful member of one of the Costa Nostra families in Southern California, and if there was one lesson he taught her, it was to never become involved with the police. So, we didn't. In light of these recent unsettling events, we made the decision to sell the two rental properties and our house and move into the northern area of Rancho Cucamonga. Following our decision, Bill Sr. found a framed picture turned backwards in the hall wall. It was the start of another round of unusual activity in our home. Each day, household objects and knickknacks would either wind up in unusual places throughout the house or went missing, and continued until the day we purchased a new house. By the end of December 1987, our transition into the new house was nearly complete. I went with Lee when she returned to our former home on Archibald to receive the remainder of her possessions. As we gathered the last boxes in her and Bill Senior's old bedroom, an explosive sound went off in the kitchen. We dropped the boxes and hurried. Splintered wood littered the kitchen in slivers and chunks. The cupboard had been almost completely ripped from the walls. As we stood staring, the shattering of glass erupted from the bedroom we were in. We rushed back and saw that the bedroom windows had been blown out from the inside. This violent occurrence persuaded us that we had made the right choice by moving. By the start of 1988, we were fully situated in our new house. Two weeks passed without any unusual happenings, and we took a collective breath and relaxed because we'd left the strangeness behind. The peace was temporary. In the hall upstairs, Bill Senior discovered a framed picture reversed to face the wall. We faced the grim possibility that whatever had been causing the phenomena on Archibald had pursued us here. But a single incident didn't have to mean anything. Lee said she may have turned the frame around when she was dusting, and we accepted this comforting lie. A series of bizarre occurrences followed. Our home intercom system began beeping in the middle of the night. For several nights straight, we'd hear what sounded like distant screams, cries for help, or our names whispered in a low voice. We told ourselves that the units were faulty, and ended up disconnecting them. Each of us were also discovering objects around the house turned backwards on a daily basis. Pictures, statues, dolls, books, all inverted so that they faced the walls. But then something happened that none of us could claim responsibility for. 
While cleaning the upstairs bathroom one morning, Lena discovered a message on the mirror written in soap. Talk to me. Naturally, we believed one of us had written the message for no other reason than someone had to have written it, and yet no one confessed. I wiped the mirror clean with a washcloth. If someone or something else had produced that message, then it could happen again. My family and I waited in the bedroom, huddled at the edges of Lee and Bill Senior's bed. I counted two minutes, then petered into the bathroom. There was fresh writing in the mirror. No escape. Each day brought me more communication. The presence responsible for the writing seemed to be a helpful but contradictory in nature. Many of the messages were actually warnings. Nini, bad wire in the attic, danger in the room, fire and death, stay away. Nini had been a childhood nickname of Lee's, used by her elder sister. She was sure it was the spirit of her sister producing the writing, but Bill Senior investigated the attic and found nothing unusual. We didn't understand why, but the presence had been trying to deceive us. Fools, it wrote next. By the afternoon, the ruse was over. The first message of the day spanned the entirety of the mirror. I hate Lee. None of us knew why this presence would write this. We didn't even know who or what it was. Who are you? Do you have a name? Bill Senior asked. We stepped out of the bathroom. By our return, a single word had been written. Prince. From the very beginning of these paranormal incidents, Lee had refused to let Bill Jr. and me try and find people who could help us. She argued that people would think we were crazy and ostracize us. This latest development was a turning point for her. We could no longer deny the paranormal nature of the activity in our home, especially now that it had turned threatening. Lee finally agreed that outside intervention was needed. She turned to the best source of spiritual assistance she knew, Faith, and contacted a church to arrange a house blessing. A few days later, a priest arrived on our doorstep. He barely made it any further. Only a few steps into the foyer, he froze. He swished holy water through the air, muttered a few words of prayer, then flew back to his car and sped off. Lee was devastated, and Bill Jr. and I knew we were going to have to explore other avenues if we were to find help. In the meantime, the communication became increasingly hostile. I hate Lee. Lee died. These words appeared in the mirror all throughout the day. Verbal threats were just the beginning. The presence initiated a never-ending assault against our house. It routinely gouged symbols into walls and doors, cut them into rugs, tore them out of carpeting, or fashioned them by whatever available means. Every surface was a potential canvas. These symbols were completely foreign to us. Many outright defied description. The most prominent was a large triangle with an S-shape attached to the bottom of it like a tail. We saw it constantly, as though our house had been branded. The presence appeared to hold a special disdain for religion, which it demonstrated through the destruction of Lee's Catholic paraphernalia. The altar in her and Bill Senior's room was routinely dismantled and scattered across the floor. Lee would often discover her statues of Jesus and various saints in ruins. The head and left arm always snapped off. Religious wall decor was frequently found thrown from their proper places, sometimes with the force to have shattered them. Intimidated by these violent displays, Lee was ready to relocate downstairs, but Bill Senior refused to give up his bedroom. One evening, they retired for the night, only to find their mattress sliced to ribbons. For safety's sake, Lee and Bill Senior moved into the master bedroom with Bill Jr. and myself. The abandoned second floor took an oppressive, heavy atmosphere. Ascending the staircase, you could feel the air grow thick and stifling, until it almost felt unbearable. Encroaching upon our lives wasn't enough, 
our unseen invader had annexed part of our house as well. But moving downstairs didn't spare leave from the presence's ire. Without anyone to receive its message upstairs, the presence began writing most of its communications on one of the mirrors in the downstairs bathroom instead. Writing like, I hate Lee, and Lee die, filled the mirror constantly. And if someone didn't wipe it clean, the writing would extend to the walls in scratches and gouges. The presence then launched an indirect siege against my mother-in-law. It destroyed her clothes, stole her personal effects, and began commenting on her daily life. When she read the Bible for consolation, it would write messages such as, God's fairy tale. Lee took to speaking the obscure language of T'Arbrisht, which is a very rare Albanian dialect to Bill Jr., presuming the entity would not be able to understand them. This would have afforded her some semblance of privacy. In its next message, however, the entity wrote to Lee in the same language with perfect fluency. In mere weeks, our predicament had escalated to an urgent, incomprehensible situation. Bill Jr. and I engrossed ourselves in search for experts. In Rancho Cucamonga, and we believe we turned to every bookstore, psychic convention, occult shop, and other potential inlets to paranormal experts. Soon, a constant stream of strangers were flowing in and out of our home, all self-proclaimed researchers, light workers, and investigators. The presence would mock our efforts to combat it, often by dismissing whichever expert was called in as gutless or having no juice. It was a way to inform us that the upcoming challenger was utterly powerless. So far, no one had come close to disproving the presence. Our first meaningful contact was a local team of psychics who came to investigate our house. They informed us that our home was inhabited by an ancient, powerful entity. Unfortunately, this information was all they could provide. The term entity stayed with us. It gave us a concrete word to describe the presence in our home, and so we began to call it such. As time passed, the entity's attacks on Lee turned increasingly vicious. From out of nowhere, but usually the rear, objects would sail through the air and strike her in the head. Shoes, potatoes, objects that could hurt without necessarily inflicting lasting damage. Then came the knives. On a mild and unsuspecting spring morning, Lee went to assume her seat at the end of the kitchen table. A cold sharpness grazed the inside of her thigh. She cried out and leapt up from her chair. The glinting blade of a knife had been stabbed through the seat. The most basic of comforts were no longer safe for Lee. Chairs, pillows, couches, and even her bed would be a potential booby trap. She couldn't rest anywhere anymore without first thoroughly inspecting the area. Our first year of occupancy in our new house had not yet passed, but we had already been changed. Lee and Bill crept through the halls during the day, trying to stay small and unnoticed, and they couldn't enter any room without the lights on. I started to grow used to sleepless nights. My nerves were signed by constant fear for my family's safety, and every little noise after dark was an alarm, screaming me to their defense. As we continued to seek out aid, all we could do was to endure the entity's abuses and household destruction. To punish our persistence, the entity constantly employed new tactics to wear away our sanity. Throughout 1988, the usual gamut of activity would be joined by a revolving slew of new phenomena every month. Pungent and revolting odors sporadically filled the house with the stench of excrement or rotten food. Strange noises pervaded most rooms, and it often sounded as though there were people walking around upstairs. Rats infiltrated our pantry and burrowed into the walls of our home. And for a month straight, crows made suicidal dives into the master bedroom's patio door. During the rat incident, Bill Sr. insisted that the rodent problem can be solved with the right amount of poison. Not only the rats will get the poison, the entity warned in the mirror. I was desperate. My insides knotted at the thought of bristling rodents scurrying all over us. 
something drastic had to be done. These weren't typical rats. In the pantry, they would stare us down from the beams, unflinching and fearless. Considering the unusual nature of the rats, we speculated the entity was involved in their infiltration. My first and last ditch effort brought me to the bathroom. The mirror the entity wrote on had come to represent it in a physical sense, so I spoke to it, addressing the entity as I did. Please don't let the rats enter our house, I said. If you won't make them leave, then at least don't let them go any further than where they are now. I left the bathroom but found no replies to my request upon my return. I knew the entity had heard me. It always heard us. But I didn't know if it would listen. And really, why would it? It couldn't see us as anything more than playthings. It may have been a coincidence, but the terrible scratching sounds in the walls ceased the next day. We considered it, but moving away again would have been futile. It didn't work the first time, and the entity made it very clear that it was never far from us, no matter where we went. We'd find tokens from the places we'd visited, a waitress's name tag from a restaurant, or objects from a store that we hadn't purchased. Worse, the entity would sometimes perform odd feats that put us in troubling placements. If we had to meet new travel experts, then outside of any hotel or motel we stayed at would be vandalized with the same symbols that marked our house. We couldn't run. We had one option. Survive. But how long could we? Our lives further deteriorated under the entity's shadow. Lee waited out, the majority of her days hunkered at the kitchen table or huddled on the couch, her bloodshot eyes scanning her surroundings for the danger she knew that was lurking. Bill Jr. soon joined me in my countdowns to sunrise, because the house seemed that much more threatening to him in the dark. We outlasted the nights, claiming our temporary solace each dawn. I could tolerate this lifestyle, but Bill Jr.'s poor health was a special concern. His physical limitations hindered his ability to cope with the disorder the entity had brought upon us, and any sleep he found during the mornings was fleeting. Between monitoring the mirror, worrying for my family and the constant home repairs, the demand for Vigilant was taxing. Yet as strange as it sounds, I wasn't particularly worried for myself. I wasn't afraid of the entity. And it was sooner, not later, than I asked myself why. Lee and Bill Jr. were terrified. So shouldn't I have been too? Yet my inner voice answered with a placid certainty that the entity could not touch me. I knew this is true, but I asked myself why. And I couldn't explain it then, and I can't now. I just knew there's no other way to say it. Frankly, even if I had lacked this strange sense of knowing, the rising fear of harm befalling my family left no room in me for self-concern. I still had absolutely no idea how I could protect anyone against an assailant who appeared nowhere at all, yet seemed to be almost everywhere at once. The only thing I could do, try as I might, is to match the entity's ubiquitous presence so Lee and Bill Jr. didn't suffer alone. Since Lee was often the epicenter of paranormal activity, and Bill Jr. hated to be anywhere outside the master bedroom on his own, this meant that the three of us spent the vast majority of our day in each other's direct and constant company, which Lee preferred. She was the first to notice that the entity never did anything to her while I was near her. If she gave me one of her belongings, such as a blouse or her wallet, I'd be able to return it to her in one piece the next day. Anything entrusted to me would never have any damage befall it from the entity. No, there were no hurling objects or hidden knives for Lee to evade while she remained at my side. But stray a step too far, and she was fair game for it. I shouldn't neglect to mention, Bill Sr. in all of this. It may seem he was oddly absent, and in a sense he was. He spectated the entity's attacks against Lee with vague interest. He was the observer cool, detached, unaffected by the sweeping invasion of the paranormal into our lives, until it entailed property damage. As far as I was concerned, Bill Sr. didn't need me watching his back, not when the greatest threat posed to him was a blow against his pocketbook. Sometime during the second half of 1988, 
we attended a local psychic fair where we learned about a woman called Red Wing. She identified herself as a Native American shaman. After I told her our struggles with the entity, she asked me to meet with her at the Los Angeles home of her tribe's elder. In a fire-warmed hut behind the elder's house, I recall my family's trials against the entity. Red Wing spoke to the elder as I did, and I thought she may have been translating my account. After I finished, she and the elder shared a few words of their own. Red Wing informed me that she had been granted permission to help us in our battle against the entity. I thanked the elder and rose to leave with Red Wing. Before I did, the elder stopped me and spoke to me directly. I didn't understand his words, but there was quite a solemn quality to his tone. Red Wing said, He says, you're not who you think you are. I didn't know what to make of that curious farewell, nor did I know what to expect from the upcoming confrontation with the entity. Days later, Red Wing arrived at our home with another shaman, a man called Fire Panther. Without explanation, they asked me to accompany them upstairs. The air thickened as I climbed the staircase. The second floor suffocated under the foreboding weight. After examining the entirety of the area, Red Wing and Fire Panther determined to start a ritual in the sitting room. Fire Panther removed a bundle of sage from a pouch and burned it at one end. He waved smoke through the upstairs with a large feather and turned his attention towards the attic. Without hesitation, Red Wing opened the attic door and Fire Panther wafted smoke into the room. The smoke blew back out. The attic was well insulated and there was no draft upstairs. We all knew the smoke was being repelled. Red Wing said we would have to face the entity in its domain. Together, the three of us entered the attic. I clicked the light on and braced myself in the doorway. Fire Panther continued to burn sage and began to chant in a steady rhythm. We're forcing the entity to reveal itself, Red Wing said. There was a sudden creak. A roll of insulation slid down the attic's back wall. The material shifted again, twisted and bent. It occurred to me vaguely that the profile of it had an enormous head and was forming before my eyes. A massive jaw deepened, sharp cheekbones arose, and a horn erupted in place of an ear spiraling down clockwise. The tip angled past a prominent brow. The completed visage faced the wall. The shadow of one of the deep-set eyes was visible from where I stood, gazing to some distant beyond. The insulation held this shape for several seconds, then crumbled to the floor in a heap. We returned to the sitting room in silence. It took us a moment to digest what we had just bore witness to. Red Wing regretted telling me the entity was far stronger than they had realized. Despite their abilities, she and Fire Panther would be unable to oust it from our home. Our search for rescue would go on. Near the end of 1988, we made the acquaintance of paranormal researcher Gary Kent. He recognized our case as an opportunity to break new ground in the field of parapsychology and offered to stay at our home to document the entity's activity. It was an intriguing proposition. We felt isolated in our plight, so the idea of someone else, someone outside our family who could observe the phenomena plaguing us seemed beneficial, as though it would validate our experience, and we unanimously accepted Gary's offer. During his first night, Gary strode into the family room and bellowed, Show me what you can do! The second floor had an open balcony that overlooked the family room. From its shadows above, a book flew down and nicked Gary on the side of the head. From that moment on, the entity set its sights on Gary, redirecting many of the torments it normally reserved for Lee onto him. It shredded his clothing, destroyed his most cherished belongings, and filled the mirrors with insults, threats, and embarrassing personal information. We'd find his mail partially burned in our mailbox, Bizarre arrangements of knives laid out in his bed in the guest bedroom, and the room itself was thrown into total disarray on a daily basis. And in the rare event that Gary thought there may have been a moment to relax, the entity would be ready to strike directly at the man himself. 
Once, while Gary sat at the kitchen table, we heard a snapping sound. Clumps of hair began falling from Gary's head. He jumped and ran into the backyard to escape, leaving a scattered trail of hair behind. I learned about Ed and Lorraine Warren through their book, The Demonologists. Their reputation and experience inspired confidence in me like no one had yet. If anyone could help us, I was certain it was them. I contacted the Warrens to discuss our predicament. It so happened they intended to travel to Los Angeles on a business matter in the near future, and they were ready to lend us their support. During their preliminary investigation, Lorraine explored our house trying to detect any psychic impression generated by the entity. Her findings were dire. There is a presence in this house, she said. It's a demon, and one of the oldest and most powerful beings I've ever encountered. It's ancient, ancient and evil. During the second day of their investigation, the Warrens determined that the right of provocation was necessary in uncovering the entity's identity. Through this ceremony, they would force the entity to reveal itself, words I heard before from Red Wing and Fire Panther months ago. I hadn't forgotten the face I saw in the shape in the attic, but what would come of the Warrens' efforts? The Warrens conducted the rite of provocation the following evening. They selected our living room for the purpose. We seated ourselves in a U-shape on the couches while Ed and Lorraine positioned themselves on a pair of chairs separated from us, but part of the formation. Ed organized a series of opening prayers. As he spoke, a heaviness seeped into the room and settled over us. During the rite, Bill Senior suddenly slumped forward. He then rose to his feet, changing as he stood up. One of his arms curled towards his body like a shriveled limb, and his spine curved into a low hunch. He hobbled towards Ed, dragging a leg. A low growl, more animal than man, rumbled in his throat. As Bill Senior stood over him, Ed's hands flew up. Pinched between his finger was a small glass vial containing a shard of wood. He thrust it into Bill Senior's face and shouted, This relic is a piece of the Holy Cross and it protects me, you cannot harm me. Bill Senior paused and sneered wolfishly, baring his teeth. His voice was hardly his own. I'll bite it off your hand, chew the wood up, and spit it in your face. With neither man surrendering any ground, Bill Senior turned his sight on Lorraine, seizing her in a glare. She stared back defiantly, deflecting him. He hobbled away and collapsed on the couch, where he had been sitting. He sagged into himself and then rose into a proper seat. He blinked and glanced around, as though he was waiting for something to happen. The Warrens believed that the entity directly influenced Bill Senior's actions. Though he seemed all right after the ceremony, the incident was a cause for concern. The Warrens didn't personally have the power to force the entity to vacate, but they made arrangements through St. Mary of the Angels Church in Los Angeles for an exorcism. But it never came to fruition. After the Warrens' investigation, Gary made new living arrangements elsewhere and departed our home. Lee was once again the sole recipient of the entity's physical aggression. She, one day, made the mistake of venturing into the pantry on her own. Bill Jr. and I were in the family room when we heard a frantic pounding on the pantry door. The door was jammed. Bill Jr. had to wrench it open, and we discovered Lee prone on the ground and in the dark. We helped her sit, and it was then we saw the evidence of an attack. Deep red marks lined her neck. Trembling, she managed to tell us that the entity had attempted to strangle her. She thought it was going to kill her. This direct physical assault pushed me to the brink. Lee had suffered more than anyone. My mother-in-law was a wonderful woman, a dutiful wife, and a doting mother. She didn't deserve this. Who did? I charged into the bathroom. The mirror was blank. I positioned myself in front of the sink and focused. Anger didn't cloud my mind, but sharpened it. I realized that to confront the entity, I had to bring it to my level. Still, I don't know where I found the courage to speak the way I did. This is the way it's gonna be. I'll treat you with respect, and you'll treat me with respect. I will accept nothing less, I said, staring into the mirror. You're not to touch my child, 
You're not to touch my husband and you're not to touch Lee. I stepped out of the bathroom to give the entity a moment to reply. There was a message on the mirror. I will not touch the child. I will not touch your husband. Lee belongs to me. I asked the entity to explain. The exchange that followed extended well over an hour. The entity wrote out a story from a past era, a tale of the dark intrigues of a French monastery in the 1600s. A cable of heretic monks once served the entity in secret. To honor the pact they had entered into, they were to perform a blood ritual. They had captured a nun for the purpose of a sacrifice, but a betrayal from within their order prevented the ritual from being consummated. In a past life, Lee was that nun, promised but not given. It had returned for her in this life, and it was to collect its dues. I'm not going to let that happen, I said, then stalled, needing a term of address for the entity. I hadn't forgotten that it told us its name was Prince, but I wasn't about to grant the entity the dignity or power of a royal rank. I needed something else to call the entity by. The entity. Then it came to me, Mr. Entity. It was the small addition of the respectful title to a familiar moniker, a good compromise and one that clarified my stance. I had no realistic way of verifying Mr. Entity's story about the monastery, but it changed nothing. All that mattered was that the Entity was going to persist in pursuing Lee, and I was going to do everything I could to keep her safe. As it would turn out, granting Mr. Entity his new title marked the beginning of a significant shift in my relationship with him, based on his willingness to offer some sort of insight into his motives. It seemed that the entity was surprisingly open to conversation. To clarify communication with it usually followed a specific procedure. Writing never appeared directly in front of us. We could turn our heads and of course in seconds a message would appear and often did on glass surfaces throughout the house. But the entity had a certain fondness for mirrors. Most of the communication occurred in the downstairs bathroom. I could ask a question, step outside and moments later a response would be scribed in soap. Initially I started conversing with it, on the off chance I may learn something to help identify just who or what he was. Our first exchanges were little more than a series of questions and answers. One question always went ignored. What are you? Even though Mr. Entity had revealed his supposed history with Lee, and probing into his true nature was ignored. It was clear it wasn't going to present any information to use against it, but conversation soon became a goal in of itself. I had caught on to a specific benefit to our communications. When Mr. Entity invested his energy in writing in the mirror, he was less active elsewhere in the house. This translated to fewer home repairs and attacks on Lee, which in turn meant the day would be less tedious and miserable for everyone. One morning, I found these words on the bathroom mirror. Lee will die in 10 days. We had seen hundreds of death threats against Lee, but nothing so decisive. Each day this time had ticked down. The prediction had to be another one of the entity's scare tactics, I thought. It had to be, because Lee was healthy, and he couldn't kill her, otherwise she'd be long dead, or so I believed. On the final day of the countdown, Lee woke up exceptionally early, suffering from sudden breathlessness and chest pain. She was admitted to the hospital, where she was diagnosed with developed pneumonia and congestive heart failure. In the ICU, Lee deteriorated further as her heart weakened. After three weeks of intensive treatment, she rebounded somewhat and was transferred to a private room. But she was still very ill and drafted in and out of consciousness. Bill Senior was largely indifferent to his wife's condition, but nevertheless he and I alternated hospital visitations while he recovered. During this time we hardly felt the entity's presence at home. He felt obliged to give us reminders. The occasional knick-knack or picture would be turned around, but I only had to clean the mirror once or twice each day. Eventually and against all odds, Lee recovered little by little and soon she was well enough to come home. I didn't realize how miraculous Lee's survival was 
until she confided in me in the night of her return that the entity came for her while she was in the hospital. Every time she was awake, she'd see a black stain on the ceiling in her hospital room. It moved closer and closer, traveling across the ceiling, seeping down the wall and sliding into place on the ground beside her bed. From that stain rose a pillar of shadow that loomed over her and extended a thin, dark limb towards her. In the shrieking space between Lee and the shadow, the air shimmered. A mist gathered rapidly, gaining color and distinction, condensing into the form of an old woman. She glanced back, regarding Lee with affection. Lee saw then that the older woman was her mother, Domenica. The shadow receded into the ground and then into nothingness. Mama was there. She stood in front of me and wouldn't let the entity near me. I would have died in that room without her, I just know it, Lee said. Was it real? Were Lee's experiences the imaginings of a delirious, fear-stricken mind or an act of intervention from the other side? I couldn't honestly say. After living in the shadow of Mr. Entity for three harrowing years, I was inclined to believe her. Lee's recuperation was going to be a lengthy process. She required supplemental oxygen while she healed. Mr. Entity took advantage of her weakening state to launch devastating new attacks. She'd often wake up in the middle of the night, gasping because her oxygen cord had been severed. Seeing her through the recovery demanded extreme vigilance on all our parts. I rarely separated from Lee during our years under the entity, but it was while she was recovering that I was most reluctant to leave her side. Sometimes it simply couldn't be avoided. One evening I asked Bill Senior to stay with Lee in the family room until I returned. I was speaking to Bill Jr. in the master bedroom when Lee burst through the doors and collapsed on her knees. She heaved breath upon breath, and I panicked that she was on the verge of a heart attack. She managed to calm down and told us what happened. After I had left the family room, Bill Senior promptly found some excuse to go to the garage. He assured Lee he'd only be gone for a minute or two, and too exhausted to worry about being alone, she reclined on the couch and waited. Her gaze wandered to the ceiling and then the second floor. The balcony, specifically, right above her, where she noticed a shadow hanging over the guardrail and thought it might have been Bill or me. The shadow stretched over the railing and came to float directly over Lee, hovering in mid-air. It was a mass of smoky fog and snake-like tendrils. It descended upon her, rotating to reveal a horrid face, an impossibly huge gaping mouth, and two eyes like lightless pits. A spur of terror gave Lee the strength to leap from the couch and run. The dark mass pursued her, reaching out with its tendrils, chasing her all the way to the master bedroom. A sudden spark of anger ignited me, anger at the entity and Bill Senior at the way we had to live. I immediately went to the bathroom and told the entity that it was not to show itself to Lee ever again. But what made me think the entity would listen? Seconds later, the mirror held a hastily scrawled message. You get in my way. Stop protecting Lee. One night sometime later, Bill Senior awoke in bed with a start. Something cold had grazed his leg. He threw the blanket off and withdrew a long metal object in near darkness. It resembled a dagger, but with a long hilt. When I examined it under the light, I saw the hilt was actually barbed and hollow. We didn't know where it come from, but we knew who had brought it. Straight away I went to the bathroom. I wanted to know the entity's reasoning for bringing this strange weapon into our home. When I entered the room, I froze. Both of the bathroom mirrors were filled with writing. On the right mirror was a dark demand. There must be a blood ritual. Take the spear and stab it into Lee's heart. The left mirror contained instructions to perform the ritual. Regents, incantations, the handling of the blood, it was all laid out in detail. The weapon I was holding was the spearhead. This was the weapon of sacrifice, the means by which Lee's blood should be shed, but in my hands it would never be used. No, I said to the entity, there will not be a blood ritual in this house. I raised the weapon to the mirror. I'm keeping this spearhead, it's mine now and you're not having it back. 
No sooner did the last words leave my lips that a tremendous force slammed into the house. The walls shuddered and groaned. I raced to the master bedroom. Everyone was all right, but shaken. It sounded like a bomb had gone off upstairs. We hurried to the second floor. Every window pane upstairs had been blown out with such force that even the drape rods had nearly been torn from the walls. After this show of wrath, I didn't count on getting any answers about the spearhead from Mr. Entity. At some point, we took the weapon to the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles, and a pair of experts identified it as a ritualistic tool from the Belgian Congo, intended for magic ceremonies and various rites. They asked how we acquired it, as the spearhead appeared brand new, yet was likely over 200 years old. We simply told them that they wouldn't believe us and left it at that. In the summer of 1989, our search led us to individuals who, like the Warrens, exuded both knowledge and competence, Dr. Evelyn Paglini. She introduced herself to us as a doctor of parapsychology and a practitioner of magic. She had originally been based in Chicago, where she had it out with rival occultists, or in her vague terms had fought a battle of magic over an unspecified cause. She had emerged victorious, but chose to relocate to California. To this day, I can't remember how or where I had learned of her, but Dr. Panglini was unlike anyone else who braved the demon's den. After inspecting our home in person, she later called us to enact her plan of attack. Over the phone, she conveyed specific phrases and symbols that were to be transcribed on the mirror on her behalf. For every line or shape we wrote, Mr. Entity would cross it out and place one of his own. The Entity wrote against Dr. Panglini with uncharacteristic vehemence. Normally, his aggression was reserved for Lee, while experts who came to our house were mocked and dismissed. The Entity poured insults over the mirror, but one message stood apart. F you. You lie to my family. We had no idea what that meant or why it would call us its family, but many years later we learned that Dr. Panglini was actually a founding member of the Satanic Church of Nephilim Rite in Chicago. By proxy, Dr. Panglini waged this remote battle of written warfare for a month. She and the entity were at a stalemate. The next phase of her plan demanded her physical attendance at our home. In preparation for her arrival, she instructed us to clear out Lee and Bill Sr.'s former bedroom upstairs. She didn't inform us of her intentions until she arrived to our house. One by one, she had us enter the upstairs bedroom, which was lit by only a candle. We were to stand in the center of the room while she ran her hands over us. Dr. Panglini explained this was done to read our energy. Once everyone had been subjected to this inscrutable test, the procedure was concluded and Dr. Panglini departed. She said she needed time to analyze our results. She called a few days later with a grim revelation. Someone in your family is keeping the entity there. Someone is giving it permission to stay. And while it has that permission, it cannot be expelled. To expose who among us was abiding the entity, Dr. Panglini performed a second remote ritual that night. Hours after we had retired to the master bedroom, Bill Senior suffered a strange episode that began with a nagging cough and ended with a convulsion-like fit. After it passed, Bill Senior suddenly came to. He was fine but oblivious to what had happened to him. During her final meeting with us in the summer of 1989, Dr. Panglini stated her findings. She said there was no question that the entity was a demon, but to the full confidence of her knowledge, she believed this demon was one of the seven princes of hell, and it could not be removed because Bill Senior was keeping it tethered to us. Unless that changed, Dr. Pangolini advised a different approach. She was told to keep the upstairs bedroom empty and dedicate it to the demon. A being of his power could make our lives wonderful if we paid it homage, and as far as Dr. Pangolini was concerned, it was also the only way we could save Lee. Lee was the first to voice her refusal, affronted by the mere suggestion. She could do no more than wish us luck, departing and leaving us in a state of complete conflict. 
and yet she had granted us a strange clarity. It was difficult to argue the reality of things, no matter who came into our home to oppose the entity. They all failed. Superficially, Dr. Panglini's explanation seemed to fit, but why would Bill Senior have wanted the entity? He may not have been overly concerned with Lee, but repairing the daily damages was expensive to say the least, and money was his chief concern. Bill Senior, of course, denied Dr. Panglini's assertions. She hadn't been the first to suggest a link between him and the entity, as the Warrens believed Mr. Entity was affecting his behavior. How could we deny the possibility of a connection between them? Lee convinced herself that any tie between Bill Senior and Mr. Entity was subconscious. Despite Bill Senior's protests, she arranged for him to attend weekly therapy with a local psychiatrist. All while various experts tried their hand at deposing Mr. Entity, it must be understood that he continued to torment Lee in just about every way he could, though she was generally safe from physical attacks while near me. The entity persisted in his usual repertoire of destroying her personal possessions and spewing written insults and threats. There were a few other common stratagems. Mr. Entity often soaked Lee and Bill Senior's bed with water, inexplicably from the bottom of the mattress up. We'd have to lug the sodden mattress out so often that we needed a second mattress for Lee and Bill Senior on standby. He would also spirit away photographs of Lee and use them to illustrate its intentions for her. We'd find photographs of her impaled on knives and placed for us to see, or knives driven into her photographs on the wall. Sometimes the entity would use her pictures in other ways to convey his intentions. We once discovered a large vintage photograph of Lee in her youth laid out on the living room carpet. A hand scythe had been placed directly over it. As Lee endured each attack, Mr. Entity would innovate new ways to isolate her. For a time, Lee's doctor's appointments would be mysteriously cancelled out of the blue. If questions, receptionists would say that someone had called to cancel them. Then, to embarrass Lee, the entity began hiding one shoe from each pair she owned, just to make the few short ventures she made out more difficult. And of course, the demand for the blood ritual persisted. During the years of the haunting, Gary Kent would periodically return to our residence, always desperate for a place to stay, and always without a single better option. These occasions were reprieves for Lee, as the entity would channel most of its wrath onto Gary instead of her. When I questioned him about this, Mr. Entity wrote that Gary too had lived a past life in France during the 1600s. He was allegedly the abbot of the monastery where the original blood ritual had been thwarted. Of Gary, the entity wrote, He punished my servants, now he will be punished. Again, I didn't know if these claims were true, but it was clear that Mr. Entity bore greater hatred from Gary than my mother-in-law, even expressing a willingness to use his blood over hers for the ritual. This threat would drive Gary from our home and lives for an extended period. In the latter part of 1990, Bill Senior's personality underwent a startling transformation. He became quiet, withdrawn, almost reclusive. He was absent at dinners and shed much of his weight. He wasn't slender, but there was a hollowness to him, like he was empty on the inside. But most troubling was Bill Senior's strange new tendency to leer at Lee. Whenever Bill Jr. and I were out of the house, he would creep into the master bedroom when Lee felt safest and alone, and would sit on the edge of their bed, mumbling to himself. He would turn his head mechanically towards Lee, and he'd stare at her until Bill Jr. and I returned home. Fearful of this menacing behavior, Lee soon refused to allow Bill Sr. back into the master bedroom. Rather than move to the downstairs guest room, Bill Senior returned to the abandoned bedroom upstairs to sleep and would continue to do so. A few nights later, a wild cry pierced the air. It came from the upstairs bedroom. Bill Senior was howling like a wolf. His nose was in the air when I burst into the room to wake him up. Completely unaware, he awoke in a daze and rolled over into instant sleep. Bewildered, I asked Mr. Entity if he was responsible for Bill Senior's deranged behavior. One mind to my body, he wrote. <laughs>
Our situation with Bill Senior added an extra level of urgency to our situation. It was like Providence when we found the business card of Mr. Steve Blake, a New Age bookstore which touted him as a ritual magician and exorcist. He sounded like the person we needed in determining whether he could aid us. He required photographs and hair samples from each of us. Too desperate to be discerning, we complied. Sometime later, Mr. Blake called us to inform us that Bill Senior was possessed and he formally offered his services and we immediately accepted. A few days after the call, Mr. Blake arrived to our home with his two friends who would make sure that no one interfered with the ritual. My family and I were instructed to wait together in the family room while Mr. Blake conducted the exorcism in the master bedroom. The house fell silent and a strange new feeling of isolation crept over the family room. Our eyes were fixed to Bill Senior, rocking in his chair. I hadn't shared with him any of this information Mr. Blake had provided us. As far as Bill Senior was aware, Mr. Blake was just another so-called expert who failed against Mr. Entity. But none of us anticipated the effect of Mr. Blake's ritual. Bill Senior's chair halted mid-rock, his body spasm and jerked. And then he went very still and stared at the wall. Bill Jr. stood ready to restrain his father. I slipped away from the room and into the hall. I told one of the men that Bill Senior was becoming agitated and I could hear Mr. Blake chanting in the bedroom, vibrating words in an unfamiliar language. A fierce howl swallowed the chants. Back in the family room, my husband had his father pinned by the wrists. Bill Senior threw his head back, unleashing the start of another howl, but the cry died in his throat. He fell back again to his rockers, slack, lifeless, and after another moment Bill Senior lifted his head. It was only white when his eyes first opened, then his pupils rolled down. His blank gaze floated from face to face as though he had just woken up from a nap. Mr. Blake's ritual was complete. He emerged from the master bedroom and met me in the foyer. He explained that he had exorcised the entity that was afflicting Bill Senior, but there was another more powerful presence in our home, a presence he wasn't confident he could remove. This was yet another devastating outcome for us. No matter what we had, we weren't convinced that Mr. Blake had actually expelled anything. Not until Bill Senior started to berate us for wasting more money on another phony. It might have been premature for us to declare that Mr. Blake had succeeded, but it appeared that he had claimed the first victory in our struggle against Mr. Entity. We tried to contact him again later, but our calls failed to go through. Whether made in or out of the house, I couldn't find his business card at the bookstore where Bill Jr. and I had first learnt about him, nor at any others as far as Rancho Cucamonga was informed. Mr. Blake didn't seem to exist. Though Lee still clung to the hope that Bill Senior's connection was subconscious, I witnessed firsthand this wasn't the case. One afternoon, sometime after the exorcism, I heard someone repeatedly entering and leaving the bathroom. I glanced from the master bedroom and saw Bill Senior slinking down the hall towards the kitchen. Once he was out of earshot, I peered into the bathroom, Blotchy streaks of smudged soap were wiped across the mirror. A wet washcloth hung on the lip of the sink. All signs pointed to the obvious. I asked Mr. Entity if Bill Senior had been talking to him. The Entity's response was, Yes, the little prick wants to use me to kill Lee. He cannot command me. As callous as cold as Bill Senior was, this was a level of cruelty I didn't think he was capable of and I couldn't understand why he would want Lee dead. Neither could I comprehend why Mr. Entity would expose Bill Senior if their goals aligned. It was difficult for me to fully dismiss the Entity's disclosures as lies. I knew that Bill Senior had been removing evidence of communication from the mirror, and I believe Bill Senior's true motives became apparent after I told Lee about her husband's apparent collusion. She too had been observing him acting covertly. The day before, Bill Senior failed to show up for breakfast, but she heard him moving around upstairs. From the steps, she peeked into the bathroom. 
and he had retrieved a box of her old bank statements from the closet and spread them out over the bed. Lee didn't know what he planned on doing with the documents. His name wasn't on her primary bank account. She had inherited her wealth from her parents, and he had no right to it. Money was my father-in-law's only love in life. He may have held on to the reins of his marriage, but perhaps it was Lee who held on to the purse strings. Divorce would split the assets, but Lee's death would ensure that Bill Sr. inherited everything they shared and grant access to her untouchable personal account. I urged Lee to get rid of Bill Sr. She was never going to be safe with him around, but Lee didn't want to believe that he sought to use the entity against her. She wasn't ready to. Eventually, to show Lee that he wasn't responsible for Mr. Entity in any way, Bill Sr. agreed to see a local psychiatric specialist for intensive therapy. He wanted to prove once and for all that there were no latent ties between him and the entity. During one of his therapy sessions, Mr. Bill revealed Mr. Entity's existence to his doctor. Bill Sr. must have forgotten. But in 1990, most people didn't casually speak of the paranormal never mind invisible assailants and conversations. His therapist misconstructed his heavy-handed account as psychosis and detained Bill for 48 hours for observation at the mental health center. Bill Sr. wasn't affronted by this misunderstanding and instead asserted that he had our interests in mind. He willingly submitted to a full two-week psychological evaluation and during this period, the frequency of Mr. Entity's activities waned. It was impossible to disregard, and the only difference in our home was the absence of Bill Sr. Bill Sr. soon passed his evaluation and was cleared to be released. We went to pick him up from the mental health center, but Lee went into the building alone to retrieve him. Moments later, she stormed out of the building and jumped back in the van, quivering with outrage. Lee told us Bill Sr. had been waiting in a room for her. He explained that his doctor wanted to speak with her personally. The doctor thought, if she received proper treatment, the entity may go away. Lee realized that Bill Sr. had convinced his doctor that Mr. Entity was a fabrication and had somehow portrayed her as the source of all paranormal activity that had pervaded our lives. Lee started to leave, but the doctor arrived. He asked her not to go, pledging that he only wanted to help her. His assurances only made her move faster. Moments later, Bill Sr. strolled out of the building and leisurely climbed into the van like nothing was amiss. He said to Lee, You're embarrassing, you know that? I thought you wanted to get rid of the entity. They fought the whole drive home. Unable to deny the extremity of his betrayal, Lee had finally had enough. As we pulled into our driveway, she suddenly declaimed, You're not stepping one foot in my house. Take your suitcases and truck and leave. I don't give a damn where you go. Just go. Suppressing his fury, Bill Sr. acquiesced, but assured us he'd be back. Two months into my father-in-law's absence, we finally began to realize that he had been a purely negative presence in our lives. We no longer had to worry about his unpredictable behavior, his attempts at collusion with the entity, or his general maliciousness. A lightness grazed our house, which further worked against Mr. Entity's diminishing influence. For the next two years, we would continue to seek out paranormal investigators and occultists as we entered into a stage of cohabitation with the entity. Lee and Bill Jr. still stowed away in the master bedroom much of the time, even though the entity's overbearing presence had receded. Though Mr. Entity still damaged our house and verbally attacked Lee, these incidents dwindled in frequency. Instead, Mr. Entity's interest in communication gradually supplanted his desire to torment my mother-in-law. He proved eager to flaunt his vast wealth of knowledge, past, present, future, and there was little the Entity seemed ignorant of, and conversing with him ensured the energy he did have was consumed. He also moved more objects into our home than before. Many, he said, were gifts, from pendulums, rocks, and bells to photographs of strangers and other odd tokens. Finally, I asked, why do you bring me these things? His answer was supernaturally uncomplicated. I want you to have them. Mr. Entity had always seemed to treat me with a modicum of respect and often complied when I told him to refrain from certain activities. 
I never pushed him too far in fear of reprisal, which no doubt taken the form of new torments for Lee. Did Mr. Entity genuinely respect me, or was it a ploy? What was the point? Whatever ulterior motive the Entity may have had, I couldn't begin to fathom it. Sometime in 1992, we received a familiar plea. Gary Kent was once again in need. His life was in shambles, a string of misfortunes had cost him his last job and left him nearly destitute. We were his last resort. As always, we welcomed him into our home. Mr. Entity poured his limited energy into the singular goal of harassing him at every turn. The usual barrage of destroying Gary's wardrobe and pummeling him with insults now included efforts to deprive him of what few luxuries he could afford. Though Mr. Entity lacked his former constancy, he was no less dangerous. One morning, Gary came running out of the guest bedroom with a shotgun in hand. Dumb with panic, he managed to tell us that Mr. Entity had laid it under his pillow. The gun had been loaded. It was a startling reminder that any piece we found was imagined. As long as the Entity remained with us, my family would truly never be safe. One evening, when he and I were the only ones in the family room, Gary informed me that he would soon be leaving us again to move to England for a job prospect, but there was something he needed to do before. He intended to ask Mr. Entity to leave with him. It was a dangerous bid. He thought the Entity had the power to turn his life around. The fact that Mr. Entity despised Gary was somehow immaterial to this belief. I questioned Gary wanting him to think hard about the chaos he risked inviting upon himself. Gary, as he put it, had no prospects to look to, no hope for a better life and no future. The entity was his one and only bid for change. Gary went to the bathroom and spoke out loud. He said that he intended to leave for England and wanted the entity to join him. They could become one. The entity didn't respond in writing to Gary's offer. And after an extended silence on the entity's part, Gary implored me to ask why, which I did the following night. The entity wrote in reply, I will not work with an inferior being. I will defeat him if I must. You told me you hated Gary, as he was long ago, but why do you hate him now, I asked. The message read, no integrity, no homage, no character, no substance, no word. I will stop him in his pursuit. Mr. Entity's condemnations were baffling. Why would he, a supposed demon, be concerned with these qualities? All I knew was persuading the Entity would be difficult, and I wasn't sure I would assist Gary in this gambit. I recalled then what Paglini had told us years ago, that Mr. Entity couldn't be ousted while one of us gave him permission to remain. If true, well, Bill Senior was gone, and there was no one to abide by the entity. The chains he had cast over us could be broken, but did we have the power to do that? Did I? Now October 1992. It had been over six years since Mr. Entity had invaded our lives, and that was why at long last, after weathering the isolation, the strife and all-consuming doubt, this nightmare had to end. I didn't know what to say to the entity exactly or if any of my efforts would work, but I had to try. Dad's gone, and he's not coming back, I said to the mirror, letting the words come to me. There's no one to keep you here, no one to feed the hatred you crave. It's time for you to leave, Mr. Entity. The Entity's reply was written in small, compact letters. Please let me stay here. It was a disarming response, as though the entity was seeking permission. There was a meekness in his plea, and something almost pitiful in the presentation, but I couldn't be swayed. Over the remainder of the month, Gary finalized arrangements to leave the country. Mr. Entity was exceedingly quiet during this period, no writing, no noises, no reports. His presence continued to suffocate the upstairs with thick, stagnant air, but it seemed the entity was contemplating his next move. By Gary's final night in our residence, we still hadn't received a definite response from Mr. Entity. He once again pleaded with me to broach the subject. Mr. Entity had anticipated me. A message on the mirror read, I want to stay here. Why don't you go with Gary? I asked. 
Not stable enough, empty vessel, the entity wrote on the mirror. I reaffirmed to the entity that he was not allowed to remain with us. If nothing else, Gary at least desired his company. The entity seemed to need longer than usual to reply, and after a few minutes his decision appeared at the top of the mirror. Gary is me. I am him. When I called Gary in to read the announcement, he was beyond ecstatic. He was positive his life was finally going to turn around, but whether it would be for better would be dictated by Mr. Entity's capricious disposition. Gary departed our home the next morning. He gave us the bare minimum time to shake hands and wave him off. Without a second glance or the barest hint of regret, he marched to the airport shuttle at the end of our driveway, climbed aboard, and it went off, carrying him out of our lives for what could have been the final time. Lee and Bill Jr. thought it was too soon to make assumptions about the entity's departure, and rightfully so. Our existences had been dominated for so long that this sudden resolution was an anticlimax. Out of curiosity, I peeked into the bathroom and glanced at the mirror. Mr. Entity had left us a parting message. Goodbye, my family. Days trugged into weeks, then months. We were wary to lower our shields, but every day that passed without paranormal activity strengthened our hope that Mr. Entity was truly gone. After an entire year without symbols carved into the house or writing on the mirror, we could at last accept that Mr. Entity was no longer bound to us. But we had still been changed by our experiences. Lee and Bill Jr. didn't feel safe on their own, and I was still ever vigilant in watching over them. We had the freedom of the entire house, and yet the master bedroom still served as our haven. It would take time, but one day we finally moved forward. In an effort to leave the past behind, the three of us promised to never openly speak of Mr. Entity again, as for Bill Senior, he and Lee divorced in 1994, and that was the last we heard of him directly. I kept distant touch with Gary for a short time. Shortly after his final departure, he told me that the tailed triangle had been carved into the door of his new apartment. Soon after, he denied that Mr. Entity was still with him and refused to say anything more. And I haven't heard from him in many, many years. It's been almost 30 years since the final days of Mr. Entity's reign. Lee and Bill Jr. have both passed away, leaving me as the last of our family to recall those trying years with clarity. I often wonder who Mr. Entity was and ponder his true connection to my family. I may never learn. Still, it's my sincere hope that someone out there will discover the answers they seek in our experiences and I still hope that someone out there may just have a few answers for me. Hey guys, it's Mort here. Thank you so much for listening. Well done for making it to the end of the video. I really hope that you enjoyed it. If of course you did, feel free to let me know in the description and stuff. In the description, in the comments, sorry. It's a long video. Um, it's not a compilation, it's, it's funny, I don't often make standalone videos this long, but I really hoped you, that you liked it. I'd like to thank my members and patrons whose names are on screen, because your help and support is invaluable. I'm going to wrap things up here though, so thank you all again, stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.